Okay, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, El Paso asked me to talk about a more methodological uh, talk about uh, what you can do with longitudinal data, um, kind of newly econometric methods, and um, what are the potential types of analyses that we can do. And so I work on a lot of program evaluation topics uh, similar to what Susan was discussing this morning. Um, and, and I, I like to think of there being two different types of evaluations. So one are evaluations where you have an existing program and you want to understand what the effects are of that program on the people who participate in it. Um, but the other situation you might be in is that you're contemplating putting the program in place and you'd like to learn something about the program before you implement it. You know, and because a lot of times we'd like to design the program in an optimal way. Well, I'll talk about this, some examples. But if you think about like the conditional cash transfer program, where you give families money to send their children to school. You know, I actually worked with Susan on the Progressive program, now the Coursera program. Um, you know, they started that program, and they had some idea of how big the payments should be. Um, you know, given the approximately the child wage earnings opportunities, um, but they didn't really do a systematic analysis of you know, is this the optimal payment scheme? You know, so you might want to design the program ahead of time, um, and then you have to do that without having data available. Right. So that's, that's, that's what I call an ex-ante evaluation, so before you ever put the program in place. Um, usually these are done using more parametric assumptions. I mean, recently I've been working on ways of relaxing some of the assumptions you need to do the modeling, but usually we need some sort of um, framework for doing that type of analysis. And so in this talk, I wanted to give some examples of static versus dynamic frameworks. And then, you know, with any sort of model, there's a question of how do you validate the model? And how do you know this is a good model? Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Okay, and Susan, I was thinking a good introduction to all the different methods that can be used to evaluate programs already in place. And these are more like treatment effects approaches, where you view the program as some treatment, but somebody that, you know, and randomization is often the, the preferred alternative if you can get a large enough sample. But then there are many different non-experimental methods. And to do this, you usually need data on a group that got the program, and then on a group that didn't get it. Okay, if you want to evaluate the program ahead of time before you ever implement it, um, or another question we might be interested in is what would be the effect of very long-term exposure? Because even when we can do randomization, normally we can only do it for one or two years. Like there are very few studies that are randomized long-term studies. Um, so we need methods of allowing us to extrapolate what if you participated for like 10 or 15 years. You know, so from existing data to do that type of analysis. Okay, and, and this idea of doing exams evaluations is actually a very old idea. Um, it goes back to um, Dan McFadden. He, he won the Nobel Prize actually in the year 2000 with Heckman, partly for this type of work that he did. Um, they were building a subway in San Francisco, which is called the BART, and they wanted to figure out where should they put the subway. And of course, you can't just put it somewhere and say, oh, I don't like that, and I'll put it somewhere else, right? Um, so he had to do forecasting of the demand for the subway, having no data, no existing data on people actually using it. You know, and, and so he built models of how people choose transportation, like what makes them choose to drive a car to work, or to take a bus, or to take a train. You know, and from these models, he was able to extrapolate some, some analysis of what the demand would be for the subway, given different places it could be built. Um, and 
then there's also this famous paper by Barry Levinson and Pecos, uh, published in Econometrica. So this is cited a lot in the industrial organization literature. And there they try to forecast the, the demand for cars. Um, and they look at how would the demand change if you change the price of the car or if you change the fuel efficiency. So it's very practical um, problems of marketing kind of. Um, and then also the models could be used to analyze what if you introduce a new car, you know, what would the demand be. So, so all these things are like answering questions about things that have not yet been done really. Okay, and there's some, <laughs> some other studies of like predicting the demand for a housing subsidy. If you give people money, usually low-income people, they give them a subsidy that helps them find housing. What kinds of houses will they choose? Um, then the second study is they had a company and they were trying to predict but in the U.S. it's illegal to have mandatory retirement. So nowadays a lot of companies give bonuses to encourage people to retire. And so they were looking for different magnitude bonuses, how many people would retire. Um, this study here looks at a welfare program where they gave people money, uh, like a, I think it was a thousand dollars, well Canadian dollars, it was in Canada, um, to find a job. So, you know, they, all, in all these cases, they, and then in this paper, we actually use the data from the progressive program to look at how the school subsidy affects school attendance, and then we ask questions about what if you double the subsidy, or, or you cut the subsidy in half, you know, or what if you made it unconditional instead of conditional. So trying to optimally design the program. And actually, the whole idea of doing this type of work even goes back to papers from the 40s and 50s and 60s. So it's an old idea that we're debating about how much of a model do you need, what kind of model do you need. Okay, so, so this is a, a static model, and then I wanted to talk about how it can also be extended to dynamic settings. Um, and, and what's the value of doing dynamics? Okay, so in this model, there's the D, but it has a T subscript, but at first just think of there being one time period. Um, so a family chooses to send their child to work, and if they send them to work, D equals one, or to school. Okay, and then I apologize that I'm an economist, so some of this language is kind of the language of economics, but um, so we postulate that the family's maximizing utility and that the things they value are consumption and then they value their child's schooling. You know, and that they kind of have to trade off. That if their child doesn't go to school, then the child would stay home and contribute. Well, not stay home. In this model, the child would go to work, but you could also have home before work. Um, and then the child would contribute to consumption, to family consumption. So they're trading off these different activities. Um, so that, that's called the utility function. So it's like the enjoyment they get out of consumption in their child's schooling. And then this is the family's utility from the child going to school. So you could have that parents with certain characteristics. So X would have like parental characteristics. Um, so for example, maybe parents with more schooling value the child's schooling more. So you could put that in here. Okay, and then this, this is what we would call a preference shot, which is like a random, unobserved component. So something that would make families behave differently, even if they're unobservables, they may look the same. So it's just some, that there's some random, unobservable affecting um, preferences. Okay, and then, so they maximize this, they're choosing consumption, well, they're choosing schooling, basically, just one choice, but that implies consumption. So the consumption that the family has is going to equal the family income, which is why I see, and then if they send the child to work, right, and not to school, then they would get a wage. And so, 
So this is the, and then the wage we don't observe for all the children. We only see the wage for children who are working. So we also specify a wage, what's called a wage offering wage. So there's some something that relates the wage to observed characteristics. And that could be things like the age of the child um, or the gender of the child that may affect their earnings opportunities. Um, and then there's some unobservable also to the wage. So, so that's the model. So it's, a, it's kind of a simple model. And so then, then I'm going to just talk about like how do we actually... The, so the model is specified up to some parameters. You know, and the goal of the estimation using the data would be to get these parameters alpha and beta, the variance and the unobservables. Those are all the parameters in this gamma. Okay. So... And, and we assume the family chooses the option that leads to the maximum enjoyment, which is the utility. So they're just trading off if the child works, that's their utility. If the child doesn't work, then they get the utility that includes the value of the child going to school. Okay, and then they just choose which one maximizes. And so then this, we could translate into like a, a probit model or a logit model, depending on what we want to assume about the unobservables. And specify a probability that the child uh, works or not. Oh, okay, yeah, that would be So usually these models are estimated using maximum likelihood, which is kind of a standard statistic. Like if you ever estimate for the model, it's usually done on maximum likelihood. So if, if the child works, we see two different things. We see they work and we see their age. And, and it's conditional on all these other observed elements, like the parent's schooling, maybe how many siblings the child has. All that would go into this capital omega. Okay. And so the ultimate goal would be to, if we could estimate this model, then we could evaluate the effects of a subsidy. Going. Okay, so I want to use this model to, to show you how you could actually evaluate a subsidy effect and, and change the value of the subsidy. You know, just like double it or cut it in half. Okay, and then since we have those preference, we have two unobserved elements, which are the preference shock and the weight shock. And so we also would be estimating the variance covariance matrix associated with that with those shocks. So these are all the parameters we're estimating. The beta, the gamma, chi, um, all these things. Alright, so actually from the weight equation alone <laughs> So we can we can use some existing results actually, and from the wage equation, if you just take the child wage equation and you do a selectivity correction of the type that Jim Hackman is famous for doing, um, that's why he won the Nobel Prize. That just from the child wage equation, we can estimate these parameters, um, this delta. Like gamma, this is gamma. So gamma we can get from the child wage equation. Alone. Okay, and so now I'm going to look at how we can how we can get the rest of the parameters. So the probability that the child works, if we're willing to assume normality. So remember this is the this is the model. And so if these shocks were normal, the the eta and the epsilon there, if the, the difference between normal shocks is also normal, right? Because normality is preserved when you take differences. And so then that would just translate into a probit model. And so then when we write down the probability, that would be the normal CDF. Right? So this this is a pro a simple probit model. Uh, and if you just ran a probit model, if Z and X were all the same, 
Like think of the kids where all the things, remember um, X are the things that affect the values of family places on schooling, and Z are the things that affect child's wages. So if they're all the same, then we would only get gamma minus theta divided by sigma. You couldn't separate them out if they were all the same. C and X, you know? Um, but if I have some elements that are in Z, but not in X, then I can actually, like for example, one of the things that we had was the distance to the city, that that affected the child wage options because there were a lot more earnings opportunities closer to the city. Okay, so that could be a Z that's not in X. And then from that, you can actually get this uh, gamma. Okay. And, and so, and for the child wage equation, so, so for the probit model you would get gamma divided by the sigma. And then for the child wage equation you can actually get gamma by itself. Okay, and so then actually, so if you have one variable that's in Z but not in X, that allows you to get everything. Gamma, beta, um, because if you have gamma by itself, and from here you have gamma over sigma, that means you can infer sigma, and then that means you can infer beta. Okay? So, I mean, so why is that interesting? That, they, that we can get everything, actually, all the different parameters from the model, but a crucial thing is to have one z variable that's not in x. And that is it. that's what economists call an exclusion restriction. <laughs> one variable that only affects the child's wages and doesn't affect the uh, value of schooling. And I mean, those are kind of hard to think of sometimes, but, but they're very valuable. Okay, so now I wanted to show you why it is it valuable. Um, if the government wants to have a schooling subsidy, so suppose they could have done this analysis before they collected the progressive data, like before they ever completed the program. They could have done this. Um, this would be the probability of, of the child going to school with the subsidy okay. And the reason the subsidy enters this way is it enters into the budget constraint. So remember the equation that relates consumption to this equation here? Um, See how if you know 1 over sigma, then you can actually forecast the effects of the subsidy before you ever implement it. Because it, through the budget constraint, it operates similarly as a child wage. Because now if they send a child to school, they get this additional and, and using this equation, we can also double the subsidy or cut it in half and see how the family would react. Yeah. And, and you could also do an unconditional subsidy. If you just give the family money, that just affects the budget constraint, and the simple shift in the income they have. So that's what I'm saying and why. Right. Um, I mean, this model why actually doesn't show up if this why is the same if they send the child to school or not. Yeah. You can actually have more elaborate models. Okay, so not only can we forecast what the effect of the subsidy would be, we can also predict the cost of the program. That's another very important question if you're defining a program. Because you can figure out how many people will take it, and then you know what the subsidy is. So the government costs is just going to be in other children times the probability that they go to school. And you can do it for all the different child ages, and for range of subsidy models. Okay, 
and, and the basic ingredients to do this is just that we have this model, and so of course the results are going to um, <coughs> depend somewhat on the model specification. But we have done studies, um, like this is some of the work that I did with Ken Wolfen, was using this type of model to forecast and then comparing it to experimental results. You know, and we actually came pretty close and of course we're one group might get lucky, but we try to do it with many different groups, like males and females, and parents with different educational backgrounds, you know, and try to look at different types of people. Okay, so this, so far, is a static model, uh, but with schooling, we'd actually like to predict behavior over time. And so, so here's a model that introduces dynamics in a simple way. The wage for the child depends on work experience, so age of work experience. And work experience, of course, depends on the previous work history. So that's why it's dynamic. Just current choices affect future options. The future budget constraints. So if the child works today, then they increase their work experience and then they'll have a bigger wage opportunity. So that's why it's actually makes them all dynamic. Decisions Okay, and so the dynamic model looks a little more complicated, um, but now you're just maximizing your expected future utility from the previous model. So you're just maximizing your expected future utility from the previous model. So you're just maximizing your expected future utility from the previous model. So you're just maximizing your expected future utility from the previous model. So you're just maximizing your expected future utility from the previous model. So you're just maximizing your expected future utility from the previous model. So you're just maximizing your expected future utility from the previous model. So you're just maximizing your expected future utility from the previous model. Okay, and, and now we also have to say, well, the experience of the child accumulates with the work decision. So she decides to work that her experience goes up by one. But the, the way you saw these models is actually pretty similar to how you would do a static model. So it's not that much different. Um, we only solved it using dynamic programming methods. Um, okay, so there's a whole literature on how to do this. But, but these types of models are only possible with logic data. So there's a whole dynamic modeling. I mean, I agree with that model, but I think consultation prospects are much greater when you have you know, major data, you can estimate a wider variety of models. Okay, and in the end it ends up being very similar to the static model, because you're just comparing. Now, now you've got these two pieces. So this part's actually the same. But now you have to take into account that if I send a child to work, um, or to, so if I send the child to school, I would get this future utility versus if you send the child to work, you get this future utility. Okay, and if, if they work, then they have higher wages in the future, so now you take that into account. Okay, and then this is an additional parameter, and this would be the discount factor, which is how much they discount the future. So that would have to be estimated. So these are the types of models in recent years I've been working on, is how you estimate this. So we actually have a sample, I think I was interested. Um, I put, like, um, 
Hay un libro de Jaras en mí, un capítulo para nuestra clase de modelos sobre economía y Si alguien está interesado, les puedo dar las referencias. En el final, hay un montón de similaridades entre un modelo estático y un dinámico. Requiere un poquito de programación. Models are not simply available Para que un maestro pueda utilizar muchos salones al mismo tiempo. 
So they did this experiment where they paid the teachers money if, if they would show up for class a certain number of days. Um, they had to take a picture every day of the students to verify that they were there. And then they built a model of how teachers would respond to this business. And they estimated the model, so it was a model of teachers. They estimated the model using the treatment group. And then they used the model to forecast the behavior of the children. So that's, that's how you can like, validate the model. But we definitely need more, more evidence on which models work. You know, we don't have, since it's very new, we don't have a lot of evidence exactly of what type of models are in what situation. There have been that many applications. Okay, I have another paper with, um, actually a lot of them have my name. There are really aren't all that many applications. Um, there are in the great map, and way more, and there's just not that many of those data from other countries. So here, this is a paper from Mr. Bravo that we've done a few years back, looking at schooling decisions um, in Chile, in Chile where they have a school voucher program and people can either go to public school or to private school or to public school. There are two types of private schools, some that accept the voucher and some that are more elite schools that don't accept the voucher. So we look at how people make those choices and how that affects their earnings opportunities. How the voucher program that came in in 1980 Okay, and I'm working on a project right now. So the, the Progressive Program, I don't, I don't know if all of you heard about this, but it actually had a huge influence on, on poverty from the world. So there's a, a book that came out, published by the World Bank, um, Robert Shady, and he, he provided a survey of all these types of programs. Mexico was one of the first that did it. Mexico and Brazil were the earliest programs, and Mexico was the only place that did a randomized evaluation. And when they showed that it worked pretty well, they then put a lot of money to support these types of programs. And now 28 different countries have similar programs. So the evaluation studies that were done at the Progressive really had a very big influence worldwide in supporting the expansion of these programs. So now they're even trying in places in Africa, Bangladesh. So we have some data from a program in Africa, in Malawi, the capital city, where they're paying girls in high school to attend school. We're trying to model the decisions they make about school attendance, about marriage, the lot of times they go to get married at a very young age, the older men, and they're finding that those conditional factors program reduces marriage at these early ages, reduces fertility, increases school growing, they did both a conditional transfer and an unconditional transfer, and they randomized that. So again, this provides us with an opportunity to validate the model. Because we can estimate the model using the standard control data, and then we can try to forecast the treatments to see how well it works. And, the, and then there, there's some other papers. So I, hopefully I'll get a chance to show you some work that we've been doing on pension program design. Because you know, pensions, it really makes sense to do a dynamic model because it's all about saving for the future, right? Like any sort of savings problem calls for dynamics. So it's hard to do a good study of like saving behavior without a dynamic model. So you kind of need one to do data for that. So we've been studying a big reform that they did in Chile um, and trying to understand what the effects of the reform are using these types of models. Okay. Um, then there, were some, there was an early model of using data from Thailand for the savings. I'm sorry, actually, I'm getting over bronchitis. 
In Thailand, they were, the same things are actually in these animals, like bullocks, I think they're kind of like water buffalo, but it's a model of the, the purchase decisions of these animals and where the investments that these farmers were making. And this is a really nice paper, that the, the paper Kvaskian Towns on the recent paper, I mean they're all nice papers, that's why I think of it. Kvaskian Towns is, is the, that won the prize for the best paper in the, the last five years, the most econometric, I was the top journal in economics. Um, and in that paper, they had a, a government program that gave money to communities that they could then lend out to people. And so it's a model of the um, decisions that individuals have about being entrepreneurs in borrowing through this program, this government program, and what effect that had. They actually compare it to conditional cash transfer programs um, as well. They actually find that this type of program was better in some ways than this conditional cash Okay. And then this Wang and Kalusi, they were both students of Wang. Um, this, this is a model of decision by Mexican workers in three different villages. It's actually using the MFP data. The, the decisions from Mexican workers about uh, migrating to the U.S. and working, uh, they actually have data where they follow people back and forth across the border. And then he's looking at how border control policies affect the flow of migrants. Um, and then fertility is a common application of these dynamic modeling methods, because where people are deciding how many kids to have and when to have children. So there's some recent papers. Well, one of the first papers from 1984 is about fertility and whether families increase their fertility if they experience the death of a child in the family. And this is a, another former student of mine that looked at HIV risk and how that affected when women discovered, well, women had the option to get HIV testing and how that affected their decisions about um, future fertility. I think they find out that they're positive for a lot of time. Seven percent of that were positive in one way. So I think I wanted to show you some examples. Um, I picked two different applications, one related to schooling and one related to this pension program design. Okay. So this is the program I worked on with Debbie Bravo. In, in the school voucher program, um, and it's very unusual in the world because Chile actually in 1980 implemented a nationwide program where families have a voucher that they can use either at public schools or private schools. Um, so, and it's been running and it still is ongoing. So it's a program that was implemented in 1901. Um, a lot of economists from Chicago participated in the design of the program. So it's a pretty unre unregulated schooling market. I think it's pretty easy to open a school. But you have to hire licensed teachers. Um, you know, so you can't just hire anyone. And, and then the government publicizes test results from the different schools. And the families are informed about how their school does relative to other schools in the neighborhood. So it's trying to help them have all the information to be able to make their decisions. You know, and, and the thinking is that increased competition will in, improve the quality of all the schools. And then also that the voucher might make um, private schools more affordable also to children from poor families. And then it might decrease in equality. Um, but it's come under criticism because some people are concerned it actually increases those inequality. Um, because now you're basically funding people who go to private school. You know, so parents who care more about schooling may be the ones that are selecting the other schools. Okay, so there are a bunch of debates about whether this program is good and whether it's, you know, what, what has it done and how has competition improved the quality of schools. So those are the types of things we're looking at. Um, whether there was improvement in private or public or private schools. How did, 
had at the school voucher program affect school choice, um, education levels, long-term learning? Um, did it increase or decrease inequality? Okay. So we use this data set that now actually there are additional years of data um, called the Inquest and Potential Social. It's a really nice longitudinal data set that I think would be where people could use for analysis, right? Yeah, it's, and they make it pretty freely available. I think you just have to say what you want to use it for, but that's pretty much it. Um, they have surveys in Spanish and English, so some of my students have been using it. And in reality, the, the reform came in and everyone was immediately exposed. You know? So we don't really have a treatment and control group. But we can use the fact that the reform came in for, for individual Chileans. You know, some people were in fifth grade, some people were in second grade. You know, so they were exposed in a different way to the reform. Or some people were in high school already when it came in. So we're, we're using that variation to try and figure out the effects of the reform. Okay, and there's a long literature that estimates the like, schooling choice models. Okay, and, and we're trying to see whether people that attended school after the reform had higher wages. Because if the schools were better, then they should have produced more human capital. And then people, it should be reflected in their earnings. So if schools improve, we should see wages going up. And we would have liked to also have test scores, but we didn't have the test scores, um, at least at this point. But we're looking at wages to see if the schools improve. Okay, and so the, the model that we wrote down, this is just kind of a verbal description, but people decide age 6 to 15 whether to keep going in school or stay home. Um, if they're in school, they decide what type of school they go to. And then afterwards, they can go to college for up to five years. Um, they start receiving wage offers, so similar to that simple model I described earlier, starting at age 16. Okay, and, then, and so they could drop out to go to work. So they we're modeling those decisions year by year. Um, and then their wage offer as an adult will depend on what type of school they went to, how many years they went to that school, whether they attended before or after the voucher program came into place, and then also their work experience. And then the model goes all the way up to age 65. So actually, the, like, one important thing is the time period of the model does not have to match the time period of the data. So you can actually write down models, dynamic models that go to age 65, even if no one in your data is that old. You know, like some people think that you have that data that matches your model. It's not true, actually, because the model has a lot of structure in it. So even if your sample is only up to age 30, you could even estimate a model up to age 65. Because right, you're assuming some stability in that function uh, over ages. So the data, the period of the data, you don't have to have perfect data to estimate these models. Like you don't have to see people their whole life. You just have to see them a few years. It's usually not good enough to have one year data. So you, you normally need at least two. Like we did this paper with two years of data. But there was a lot of retrospective data because people were asked about their past employment history. You know, so we could actually fill in some things from the way the survey was designed. That we did put a lot of information in the survey about historical um, schooling behaviors and, and work behaviors. Okay, so these were, just to give you an idea of what we actually learned from this, um, so we learned that the attendance went up at the, at the private subsidized schools, as you might expect when the voucher program came in. And actually, attendance went down a little bit at the more elite schools, because now that the less elite schools were free, some people actually switched. Um, college going went up. So even though the, pro the voucher program doesn't affect college at all, because it gets people to stay in school, then more people become eligible for college. So actually, college attendance went up. And then we looked at, at people from poor backgrounds 
and as people from wealthier backgrounds, because there was a question in the survey about whether the family was poor growing up. Um, we were concerned, do the poor benefit in the same way as the wealthier? Um, and we found that they did, actually. The, the there were no big differences by the poverty status of the family. So, We have a poor sample and a non-poor sample, and it was pretty similar. And it was about one year more in education that they got as a result of the voucher program. And then we could also look at lifetime earnings. And we could look at um, labor force participation. It turned out labor earnings did not go up that much over the lifetime. The reason is that people stayed in school longer. So that, that time when they're in school, they're not earning. And so um, earnings did not go up a lot. And labor force participation, it actually went down when people are younger because they're in school instead of working. But if you look at it like more utility-based measures, utility actually goes up. And then here, this, we're looking at the um, inequality measures, too. So this is like lifetime earnings, discounted lifetime earnings, um, with the, well, it's actually in cases. <laughs> uh, but it's with the reform, without the reform, and looking at the whole distribution to try to get an idea of inequality, um, and there were no big increases in inequality. You can see that the, this utility is considered a measure of welfare, and welfare goes up at the bottom of the distribution. So the concerns about, it, about the program increasing inequality, we didn't find that. We found that it actually increased education, increased college going, um, there was some evidence that it improved the quality of schooling. And, the, and then the other example that I was going to talk about, so that, that's a schooling example, so it's more the choices at the beginning of the lifetime. And then I, this is work I've been doing more recently, um, also using the Chilean data set. It's the same data set, but Merck, it's a longitudinal data set using now additional waves, since we did this more recently, and merging it with some administrative data. <laughs> so Chile um, recently implemented a big pension reform. Actually, I think this probably is interesting for Mexico, because I think the Mexican pension system is very, very similar to the way that the Chilean system came first, I think, um, in the 1980s. So many countries now consider a crisis that you have so many older people retiring and not enough younger people working. So this is a big problem in the U.S. and also in many European countries and also in Asia. And Japan is especially. And Chile was one of the earliest countries to switch from the pay-to-go system. The pay-to-go is just when you collect the money from the young people, you get the money from the older people. Chile switched from that type of system to a private account system where you actually pay a mandatory fraction of the wages to a private account and then a whole lot of countries actually adopted that type of system. So it was a model for many other countries. Um, and the main features are that your wages, you pay 10% to a pension account. You get to choose who manages your fund. But nowadays, I think there are most six big companies that do this. Um, very restrictive access. Y, eh, so can't, I, I think it's very hard to get a bar on this. So when you retire, for women, for some reason, retirement age is earlier in Chile. But then they also have what's called a minimum pension guarantee. Which is, if your pension is really low, then you get a minimum pension guarantee. And then if you work, then you get a minimum pension guarantee. 
Si trabajaste en una gráfica de eso, si trabajaste un número de años y contribuiste al sistema, tienes un mínimo garantizado. Esa es una característica de seguridad en caso de que algo malo suceda. But they were very concerned about the system that they had because women were getting a lot lower pensions than men. Very few women qualified for the minimum because the department was going to work 20 years. Very women worked in the formal sector for 20 years. And so they did the Jewish Forum in 2008. And the emphasis was on reducing old age poverty and also reducing the gap in pobreza y una gran brecha también entre lo que es el género. Este es parte de la reforma. Este es el número de años que se construyó y este es la cantidad de pensión. This pension everybody qualifies for. This is like a welfare pension. And then if you work 20 years, you get this larger pension. But you see, this, this creates some weird incentives for working because there was a range where, like here, if you work more, you contribute to the system, your pension is not a lot. So they were worried that there were some incentives to join the informal sector. Okay, and that's the new system. And that's the new system. So now, if you work more, you get a higher pension. So they eliminated the twenty-year pension. And this is much higher. Like if you make too much money, you don't qualify for this. But you know, people that have a low pension amount, they might qualify for this, and then gradually it gets reduced. So the big reform is this one. They also introduced a bonus for mothers, thinking that women couldn't work when they had children in that year. So they gave them money as if they were living on wage for work, and they were able to have a child, and they made it retroactive. So suddenly all these women got money dating back to when they had the child. So it was actually a big increase in women's pensions right away. And then there were couples came that we actually did not incorporate in the model. It was mainly because we didn't have disability, they changed the, I think women are less likely to become disabled or they made the then also they allowed for voluntary pension contributions, but very few people made voluntary contributions. So they made very few contributions voluntary. ¿Cuánto tiempo tengo disponible aún? And then, of course, the government wants to know what are the costs, what are the changes in tax revenue. We actually also use, well, I'll show you kind of the decisions in the model. And then, compared to alternative reforms that differ from the one that was actually in the United States, I think they're doing more reforms, right? Decisions of households, and the households could be either single or two person. 
So one important thing is that a lot of women become widows. So you have to be able to model the probability that it's lost time and that one person just keeps living as a single person. So, and then we, we estimate the model parameters using the data prior to the reform, and then we forecast the effects of the reform, and then compare it to what actually happened to try and get an idea of whether the model has a lot. And then we also then do longer term simulations um, and then lastly, we haven't done a lot, we're still working on this, but we did some alternative programs, like hypotheticals, reforms, just So it's a model of single households and married couples, and they're defining savings. <coughs> So if, if they work, they have to put 10% of their wages in their pension system. But they also can file on savings in their bank account. So they can, we actually made it increase. So they can save like 0%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%
And then in the model, we can take away the reform and the old system. So we can see what effects the reform had. And we're using this estimated of data collected prior to the reform. So you can see that the reform then worked a little bit more. Working in the Dow, formal sections in the Dow, and women did not respond that much. So taxes collected actually went up a little bit. But the program was very expensive. So this was a cost. This is in millions of Chilean pesos chilenos per capita per capita. But the program, the program. Mainly because of this minimum protection. Remember that they eliminated the three-year requirement and they made it a lot more generous. Um, so it's, it's pretty expensive. And the women are also getting this child bonus. So the, the net cost to the government has gone up a lot. But we found that the concerns that the government had, that there was an incentive to, to become an informal sector worker, you know, because under the old system, you had to contribute 20 years in the formal sector. So they were worried if you eliminated that requirement, more people may choose now the informal sector. And we're not finding much evidence of that. So there's not a big incentive to join the informal sector. Um, it definitely reduced poverty by a lot, actually, because now all these older households qualify for a much higher, higher minimum. Okay, I think I'm okay. So we did one, okay, so let's, I just set these things up. Um, well, we, we also did this other design. So a lot of money is being spent in this, this tapering region. And we did another design where they just didn't have this type of formula, where they just had the flatness. Um, so even though that it introduces maybe some incentives for informality, you know, we found that that wasn't a big problem, even though like, theoretically it's there. Um, and we found that this design, which is different from the one that they actually implemented, also achieves a lot of the same objectives and is quite a bit cheaper. So, so this is comparing the actual reform that was done to our hypothetical alternative. Okay, so working this down a slight bit, but there's not a big response. Um, but you can see that it's, it's much cheaper, actually. The reform is much more expensive than our alternative. So the government could maybe save a lot of money by doing this instead. You know, and still have similar outcomes in terms of work. So we're still working on this and trying to use some additional uh, types of policy alternative designs. So I think that a major benefit of being able to do this type of modeling is that you can evaluate policies before you even implement them, and you can vary policy parameters to help you design optimal programs. Because it is very expensive to implement programs and then you find they don't work and abandon them. You know, in the U.S., that happens a lot. They implement a lot of programs that don't work and then you don't. Um, but of course, the major concern is that the models rely on some assumptions about the structure of the model. Um, and for that, you know, the, their approach is to validate the model. But I think the value of experimental data is that you can actually forecast the effects of the experiment and learn about which model does well in forecasting, and then go on to use the model for other questions. So I, I think you can combine experimental analysis with um, observational analysis, you know, and try to answer more questions. Because an experiment normally just gives you what's the effect of this program, but it doesn't let you look at alternative programs. Okay. So I, so that's what I've been working on recently is is trying to combine like experimental data with non-experimental data. There are also some other people working on these kinds of questions. So I think
think that that's kind of a, a useful way of combining the different types of analysis. But to do this, when you do the experiment, you actually have to collect a lot of data. So the unusual, unusual thing about the progressive data is they, you know, sometimes when people do experiments, they can collect the bare minimum. Like who was treated, what was the outcome. You know, then of course you can get the treatment effect, but you can't really do much else. You know, but if you collect a lot of information, not only can you get the treatment effect, you can also uncover the mechanisms, like how did the treatment effect come about. You know, so I think you get a deeper understanding of, of the program, and you can also answer questions about program design. And so I think it's really important when you design experiments to think beyond just the experiment to also collect data that would allow for observational type of analysis. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a really, really good lecture. Uh, I got a number of questions, but I am going to open to the audience uh, for questions. No, then I, I have a lot. Um, um, one of the uh, uh, there are many angles in your talk, but uh, one that I would like to talk a little bit more. Uh, and I think this last example that we were discussing could be used to, to ask that, is how, um, you know, the ability to uh, have the experimental designs and the logical flows, as you said, you know, allows you to evaluate even before uh, the conditions happen, but also to kind of uh, Introduce the uh, ability to evaluate the policies that are working. And in the case of Mexico, you know, uh, we try to move to that, but, uh, but still, uh, you know, there is not a long tradition of policy, uh, you know, designing policies based on evidence. So I'm going to use kind of talk a little bit more how the research. Uh, you have done have uh, helped to move actual politicians into the thing. Uh, you know, some stuff. I, I know that you know academia is not the place to change the world, but uh, I know that the world has done a little bit of that. So could, could you tell us a bit more about that? So I think that, that like initially when we did the evaluation of Progressive, it would have never had such a big effect. You know, in Mexico, it survived to, to many administrations, which is unusual. You know, because normally an uh, administration has a program, and then a new administration comes, and they want to have different programs. You know, and so you really need a lot of evidence that a program is working for it to survive from one administration to the next. So, and I think the fact that we had a very convincing evaluation like with a randomized design was really crucial for it surviving for so long. And then definitely for expanding in other parts of the world, it was really important, the evaluation. Um, the work that I showed you for like, the Chilean pension project, we started that project um, for the government, actually. The government asked us to do that. They commissioned a few different studies um, using different methodologies. Uh, and then they asked us to present the results. The Minister of Labor is an economist. Yes, in Chile, a lot of the government officials are economists, and so there's a lot of support. Um, but I guess here, too, in the U.S., they're mainly lawyers. Like most of our government officials are lawyers, and there's not, I would say, we don't have the strongest support for evaluation in the U.S. either. It's like it's a problem. 
that they implement lots of programs without evidence. Like for example, you know, after Progressa was so successful here in New York City, they thought, oh, we'll do it too. Okay, so they tried to do a Progressa type of program in New York City, but the money that they gave to the children was actually less than the children get in Mexico, which of course is not going to work in New York City. You know, because the, I mean, the, everything's more expensive and the families need more money, so then it wasn't very successful. But I think it was because the payments were too low. You know, so it just wasn't very well designed. Um, but I, I think having good evaluation is important for the program surviving. You know, and then over time they have changed the program in some ways to respond to some of the evaluation results. Like, <laughs> like for example, they found older people were not going to take a lot. And then they changed some features of the program to incorporate more poor older families. Um, maybe another question? Yeah. Uh, isn't your work shows uh, the relevance of the technology that has started in the mind? What could go beyond the experimental Even use the experimental my concern now, I mean, say, let's say, let's take the case of Chile, which we have uh, data, deep administrative records, and things like that. Uh, I guess what we need now is something like a more, uh, say you work in a, in a more complete model. Uh, is it the, Public policy design. Uh, we should need something. So, for example, uh, for entering into the pension policy debate, uh, we could easily uh, ask you eight or ten so what happened is that this parameter or this other parameter of the change is just to help the system. And your type of models are done for this one, it's like sometimes structural models takes a lot of time. It's not that easy. Or it's very specific skills to me. So, if there is a way of making this more easy to deliver, the thing is we could use that uh, as our machinery for example, the perspective policy options. But uh, I don't know if you see that something like that is easy uh, the same thing for you face here in Mexico or in other countries. You promise you get some answers for three years. It's not going to be great. Right. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, especially, I mean, my target is not usually to answer a positive question. Like, I'm usually trying to do models at the frontier of what you're able to you just try to publish it somewhere, you know, so, so I don't have a, a very short run objective usually, and so it's true, like, I mean, we have pretty powerful computers to solve these models, and it does take sometimes years to you know, really arrive at a good model with the parameters and to fully do the study. I mean, one thing is you can just keep, make it a little simpler, you know, like if you only have a few decisions, you can estimate that much more quickly. And I have had a lot of graduate students, um, like in PhD students also from Mexico, like I had a student who was modeling fertility decisions and looking at how Segura Popular affected prenatal care and where women went to have their children. And he estimated this kind of model, you know, in like one year. Um, they have a short horizon because they're trying to finish their PhD. Um, so I, I think it's feasible, but 
I mean, definitely, you probably want to start with something a little bit similar or simpler. But you know what you can do is you can write down the model. Because um, the hard part is really the estimation that takes so long. You can think about the model, and I think that provides a good guide as to what variables you should include. You know, so even if you do a more quicker type of analysis without estimating the full structure, like let's say you just estimate what affects schooling decisions, like a probit model. At least this will tell you what variables belong there. You know, why do we, and so it's not just completely out of nowhere. You know, so it has some theoretical basis for um, how you specify the problem, even if estimating the full model is not always feasible because of the time constraints. Although now for Chile, we could actually do some, now we have an estimate, so we could probably do some of the before. But it took me six years of time to do the more complicated model. Uh, I would like you uh, to uh, comment about the uh, uh, interest conflict uh, arising during these evaluations of uh, programs, social programs like uh, Oportunidades, the so called Prospera and other uh, programs of reform, reforming uh, 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 pension uh, systems in Mexico, and the IMSS and the Eastern. Because, uh, for example, most of the official evaluations have been done uh, in the case of Prospera by the Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública which depends directly on the Ministry of Health, which is uh, the, uh, the, the institution which is uh, implementing the health part, the health care services uh, component uh, within the Prospera uh, program. So, uh, if you can uh, comment on this uh, conflict of interest. Yeah, I think it is. It's definitely a conflict of the people doing the evaluation from the personal stake in the results. Um, I think evaluations are much more convincing if you, if you get an outside firm. But even then they have some stake because they're being paid by this firm. But, I mean, I've worked on a lot of private firms on the outside person hired or even influences which programs get adopted. Yeah. Certain firms can make a lot of money by implementing certain types of programs, which may not be the best programs. Um, so ideally, I think you want to separate the evaluation group from the people that are proposing the program and they're going to be making money off of it and then those activities ideally should be separated to make it more convincing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.